You're listening to this week's message from the Sunday Preview, a version of OSL's own The Shop podcast, where we discuss life, the faith, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the modern world. It's real talk about real faith in the real God. Welcome to another session of Sunday Preview. We're going to look at the the good book today, God's Word, starting in book the book of Genesis, but... Before we do that, if you're watching on YouTube, you see we have a new face in the room. Uh, if you're listening, and it's not oh. Captain Radkeys. If you're listening <laughs> just online through the podcast, it's Olivia Jablonski. Welcome, Olivia. Hello. Olivia, if you don't know Olivia, she is our DCE here at OSL. You've been here for how many years? Five years. Five years. If you haven't met Olivia yet, go meet her on a Sunday morning. Come by during the week, meet her. Great person to talk to. Kind of an interesting story. I was a adult counselor to Olivia at Messiah Lutheran in Plano when she was in high school. Mm-hmm. So I can vouch she was a solid Christian then. She's a solid <laughs> Christian now. We're really excited to have her on this podcast. And Mark's really old. I am really <laughs> old. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see evidence of that. I am old. and I'm good with that. But you're older, Tim. That's true. That is true. All right. Let's get into it. So this is a big Sunday, right? Pentecost. It is. It's Pentecost. That's a big Sunday. And so we obviously have readings that are going to be centering around Pentecost and the Holy Spirit and, and God speaking through people. And um, so we're going to start out, though, in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. And this is your sermon text, right, Tim? Correct. Okay. So I'm going to have Olivia. Olivia offered to read this. So, man, right out, of the, right out of the gate, she wants to read. So, Olivia, kick us off here. Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Through 9. Now the whole whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Yeah, I love this text because I think it's so applicable to today. Do we not still have this problem where we think we are God, and we think that we've got things under control, and we're calling the shots, and we're keeping things going, when in fact it's really the Lord that's doing it? So uh, I'll stop there, Tim. I know you have lots of thoughts on this because this is your sermon text. So lead us into what you, where your mind is sitting on this for Sunday. Well, the title of the message is Confusion to Clarity. Uh, and there's always a connection and a thread between Babel and Pentecost. That's pretty strong. But here, at least in Genesis, you know, the Lord has told them once they come off the boat, Noah and his family, you know, they're supposed to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So they were supposed to spread out over the earth, right? And they don't. They stay there. They want to make a name for themselves. Uh, they want to be God without God is a phrase we'll hear a number of times in the message on Sunday. Uh, and so God stoops down, which is, you know, good language of, God coming down as they're seeking to go up, and they pay attention to what's going on, and we see some neat things like God's created us really, you know, to be pretty incredible, really. If we put our minds to things and unify, there's a lot that we can do. Uh, God testifies to that. So uh, God decides that uh, he's going to bring confusion, right? So they will no longer be unified uh, and he's going to change the languages up so they can't communicate and can't work together as a team. And ultimately, this is the beginning of nations, right? This is where nations begin, is this spreading out, going to these different places, different languages, different locations. Uh, and it's the, the beginning of 
nations and in the whole world. And so uh, God does in the end get them to spread out, but not in the way that it should have been. It should have been through obedience. And the same thing happens at uh, Pentecost in the New Testament, right, is they're supposed to go out with the message and they don't. And then persecution is what actually takes the gospel out. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, I think it's helpful. It's like a good example of why context is so important because reading it initially can feel really confusing. It's like, well, they're one people and they're united and they're working together and this is the beginning of what they can do. That sounds really great. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then you have to take into consideration why was it then that God broke that up? Well, it goes back to that command that he had given them because, you know, we see in verse 4, it gives us a clue. Um, it says, the people were saying, let us make a name for ourselves. And so mm-hmm. I think that I have to go back to that verse when I'm reading it because it's like, oh, and re- being reminded, like, God looks at the heart. So even though outwardly this may have seemed like a good unifying effort, it wasn't in line with what God was willing for them. Yeah, that's a great point because it's like, let's work really hard so that all the world might see us Mm -hmm. and what we've done and spread our glory, right? And and it's completely contrary to what God desires of his people, which is to spread his glory and work for his good. And they exchange that for themselves. Imagine that. (laughs) Collective people get together, find their skill set, become strong, and what happens? They, they turn away. Well, and to Olivia's point, though, like, let's not miss, though, that we still have this power to come together to do great good also. Sure. You know, and I think that sometimes that gets missed, I think, in this passage is it's, like, always bad. And it's like, no, God has made us in such a way that we can do incredible things yeah. when we're unified around good also. And, and I think sometimes that's what gets missed today is we're – we think today when you hear unified, I immediately think the next word, factions, you know? Uh, so we're not moving in one direction together uh, for one common good. Yeah, it goes back to the motivation behind it, too. Mm-hmm. Like, are we being self-centered or are, are we seeking after God's glory to better the kingdom? Yeah. And they weren't, I mean, they weren't wrong. Like, God gave them the skill to make bricks. God gave them the skill to build a tower. God gave them the skill to construct. God gave them the skill to the relationships to be able to... to to function cohesively with peace and all that stuff. It's all good, but it's when they then take those things that are good and they turn it into a God of themselves and they turn it into things that are, that are not of God, not of the one true God. Mm-hmm. And how often does that happen in our world today? Mm-hmm. Lots. Now, how would you explain this text to someone who says, this is just God being a punk? <laughs> like, this is just God coming in and saying, yeah, I don't like this. I'm just being wrathful. Where is the good in this for the people? Well, the, the good is he brings their evil to an end immediately. I mean, to me, that's the good. It's kind of the, the law is the confusion he works, you know, which halts them going farther down a path they shouldn't go. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's where I kind of look at it as like, to me, I equate it to the same thing with the Holy Spirit when he convicts us and stops us in our tracks. Well, that's better than going all the way down the track in our sin. <laughs> you know, so And it's seeing that bigger picture better because when God does this, when God confused them, it was painful. Now they mm-hmm. couldn't understand each other. Now they got scattered. Their plans, their designs, all they wanted to do that they thought they loved and they wanted suddenly now was uh, rubble or whatever. And then so it feels painful, and that's kind of like the law today. God's law still directs us and reveals our sin to us and it's painful but when we look at the bigger picture we look at the greater the greater narrative of what's going on it's ultimately for our benefit of what god's doing get through the pain humble yourself check your ego move forward and there's good stuff on the horizon Mm -hmm. and most simply put when you walk in your own ways versus god's ways life will be more confusing yeah simple you know it's real simple you don't forgive, relationships will be harder. Right. Ultimately, you don't live by God's commands, and it may feel good in the moment, but ultimately the end game of that is not only destruction in your things here, but ultimately a complete turning away from God and destruction eternally. Mm -hmm. So any other thoughts on this one? All right. 
Let's jump then to our second reading. We're in the book of Acts. I think it's the first time and since Easter we've had Acts as a second reading instead of a first reading. Mm. So we're looking at Acts 2. It's backing us up again into Acts, the start of Acts. Acts 2, verses 1 through 21, and this is, this is the Pentecost text. This is the, the big pinnacle of excitement around God's Holy Spirit coming onto the scene. Um, Olivia, I'm going to kick it to you to read again. And guess what? Mm-hmm. Have fun with all those names. <laughs> <laughs> Here it comes. Yeah, I, well, I've been teaching the fifth and sixth graders, and we just had that there you go. in this week. I was like, just say it with confidence. You won't exactly. know the difference. It's all good. Um, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocked and said, They're filled with new wine. But Peter, Standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in these last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Nice job on the names. Impressive. So if you want to know how to say those names, rewind this. <laughs> Don't verify, just go with it. Yeah, so this is, a, this is an exciting text. This is the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the big Pentecost that we celebrate. Um, and I think one of the things, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the things that Christians can kind of confuse on this is the speaking in tongues, where what's occurring here is they're actually able to speak languages. Like I can't speak Spanish and all of a sudden can speak Spanish or you can't speak Polish and all of a sudden you're speaking Polish and they're like, what, what's going on here? It's not necessarily someone going whatever. And somehow that's communicating something of the Lord. Um, and what's interesting about this though, is we go back and we look back in our old Testament text and God confused their language law And then we fast forward all the way to Acts here, and God gives them the ability to start speaking fluently to each other gospel. And so you 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 look at that great big picture, and you know I asked the question about the beginning of where's God's kindness in this, and we see it coming into it in Acts here, where God is allowing them to communicate and speak to people and, and communicate with people that they previously could not, which amazing, truly miraculous in that moment. Thoughts on this? Bueller. <laughs> well, you have the, you know, like we just talked about, you have the, the nations formed and spread out, and then here you have the nations coming back to kind of uh, a location and a word being proclaimed that's understood by all of them, even in light of the consequences of Babel. You know, so, and then you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, for, for what purpose does God reverse the effects of Babel, if you will? And it's for the proclamation of salvation and Christ crucified and risen. Mm-hmm. 
right? And and the Holy Spirit will be the one who fills people to proclaim this message throughout the world. So uh, it, it's interesting is, you know, they get spread out because of being against God, and then yet God brings them together and, and lets them hear, and he speaks to them to let them know he's for them, you know, and this is how he's for them. And so, yeah, yeah it's kind of the reverse of Babylon for, for a purpose. I think one of the things that strikes me too is so I think Pentecost, we often obviously associate with this event where the tongues of fire came and they had the Holy Spirit and they were able to speak in tongues, but Pentecost was a Jewish holiday and that's why they were all there. And so um, I think it's really cool that God orchestrated it at a time when there would have been multiple people there in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So many of them had even stayed from Passover. Sure. Um, So there's like hundreds more people than would have normally been in that space. So God orchestrated it to happen at just the right time that the gospel would even be heard by more people. Mm -hmm. And more people, obviously the link being they have different languages from different areas. And so it's completely illogical. God has all these people. It's like, it's like going into Newark airport where in the international terminal and the or just Costco and Plano, (laughs) the 25 different languages that are at one gate I remember being in that airport and one gate, there were so many different dialects going on Mm -hmm. and thinking about that, of how impossible it would be if people were all only their native tongue communicating to them and also communicating something as complex as Christ died and rose for you. Eh, come again. What? (laughs) You know, like that, that whole thing, the whole story itself is difficult without a, with, without a language barrier. Mm -hmm. And then you put a language barrier in the middle of it. It's exciting. It's to me, it's, I look at this today and I, I'm like, okay, God's not necessarily going to give me the ability to walk out of here and speak Ukrainian to the person over at 7-Eleven, okay? But I do believe by the Holy Spirit, God will give me the ability to share the gospel where he wants me to in the language he's given me and the means that he provides. And so this speaks to the excitement of how the Holy Spirit is with us. It's going to talk about the helper in a minute in the gospel, is with us to share the gospel with the world. Back to what you were saying, Tim. The unification God created was to what? Share the gospel. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose was to bring Jesus into the world. Yeah, and and just to iterate a point you made earlier, too, is that the tongues are known human languages. Right. You know, that's a big thing to to put out there. You know, these are these are nations and people who at least if like Olivia said, they're they're coming to Jerusalem, and so Jerusalem is packed at this point. You know, and I've heard this too when people say, "Oh, you know, Paul preaches and there's three thousand that convert." Like that would have been a very small percentage of what came to Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, now that person was trying to make the point for the wrong reason of like, "See, it's no big deal. It was only small <laughs> percentage." You know, and I'm like, but "No, three thousand souls coming to Christ is always a big deal. <laughs> One coming to Christ is a big deal." So, uh, yeah. So the known languages is a is an important part, and I would say you. Like, if you have the gift of tongues, let's say, at least my interpretation as I read the scriptures are those people who do have an ability to learn multiple languages. You know, there's people who speak five languages. And and you can be somebody like me who had to learn a language for seminary or two languages, and I wasn't real proficient or good at it, but that wasn't true of all my classmates. Some of them took to it... Just right. almost like they grew. And to me, I was like, that's a gift of tongues. Like mm. they can pick it up quickly. They can do it. Uh, and there's so many people I've seen, like, you know, we, we talk about Bishop Barron sometimes. Like, I think he speaks five or more languages. And like, that's mm. when I think when they can talk and move in and out of a language, that's a gift. Yeah. You know, period. Like, yeah. You can study, but for some people, it just comes easier. I should not yeah. covet, but I covet that skill. Oh, yeah. Really I cool. want that. I, I worked with a lady in my previous job that I think she, she knew four and was working on Arabic. And she's like, yeah, it just comes natural to me. And mm. God, what I, w- I would love to have that gift just for the just my brain can't sort the things out. You speak Spanish, right? Uh, I can get by. Okay. You, it's much more than I can. <laughs> but and it's, then, like it's, I've heard, if you know Spanish, like it's you could learn Italian probably quicker. Like there's some things that are similar, you know. Is that true? 
There, there's some similarities for sure, but I'm validating his assumption right there. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you just can. <laughs> if I do Spanish, I know right. Italian. I'm, I'm not saying that, no. but I think there's some. There's a lot of fundamental root yeah. things that are similar. Scusi, the way Scusi, <laughs> Scusi, pizzeria. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure pizza, cauliflower crust <laughs> pizzas. <laughs> can I get one of those cauliflower crust? <laughs> Tim wins the day. <laughs> well played, oh, sir. Man. Oh God, beat me to it. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I was looking uh, kind of when he's um, referencing the prophecy um, from Joel. All right, he like I love that he distinguishes that he's pouring out his spirit on all flesh, on mm-hmm. sons and daughters. And mm-hmm. I think um, I don't know. I think it's just so easy to brush over that. And um, well, I think people in general tend to downplay maybe what gifts the spirit has given them or, you know, how he empowers us with his spirit, whoever we might be. So, Mm -hmm. but I I just love that too. And especially because, I mean, as a woman, it's nice to know, Oh, Hey, we're not left out. (laughs) Right. Sure. So, and I think us as Americans need to read more texts like this on all flesh, on all flesh. Cause I think sometimes we can get really sideways in thinking Christianity is made for Americans and Christ died for America. Not, not a, Wherever, no, it's all flesh. It's all countries. It's all people. It's all languages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and here you see Pentecost kind of bursts the boundaries of culturalism. Mm-hmm. You know? So you, to Olivia's point, is you have maybe a Middle Eastern mindset, which is the origins and foundation of our faith. But here, when the Spirit comes so abundantly, uh, He comes on male, female, young, old servants, you know, all these things that would have been seen very different culturally then, Mm -hmm. yet all are given access to the Spirit. Why? To prophesy to the truth, to to proclaim God's truth, His way, His Christ, salvation, all these sorts of things. And so it'll come from uh, all, all people. And, And we see it like, and when we say young, we don't just mean like our teenagers who deserve respect, but I mean, like Jesus even says is, if these rocks, you know, didn't cry out, but even from the lips of infants, I'll ordain praise, you know. So because we can't always articulate it, you know, it doesn't mean like when a baby squawks in worship or something, you don't know if that's not a communication with God. Yeah. You know, I mean, you don't. And so we just assume, well, no, it wouldn't be because they're this age developmentally, blah, 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 blah. But Science, 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 science. Yeah, and... So I, I just, to Olivia's point, is that the Spirit is for all, and redemption is for all humanity, wherever you fall on the humanity category. Right. You know, old, young, Egyptian, Israeli, English, Costa Rican, it's for everybody. And it connects with, I won't quote the book in the verse because I don't know it, but it connects with the scriptures It talks about we all have a purpose and we all have some kind of gift and role in sharing this gospel. Some are meant to preach, some are, you know, that mm-hmm. first Timothy, maybe. Um, and I think it speaks to the fact that everyone has, you have the gospel, you have the Lord's word, you have a role in sharing this. And oftentimes it's, it's someone that's not a pastor preaching in a pulpit that's making the biggest difference in the lives of people in the real world in sharing the gospel and bringing people to faith. So, just because you're not doing something that may have some kind of high esteem in the church doesn't mean that you're not doing some incredible work for the gospel. I have seen preschool kids lead parents back to church. Yeah. You know, they can recite Psalm 23, pray the Lord's Prayer, and the parents are like, crap, I, don't, I can't even help them if they stop because I don't even know. <laughs> and so, I mean, God's used even, even that age to, to awaken faith of parents. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, it's exciting. This speaks to how God doesn't live within the bounds of logic and reason that we live in mm-hmm. or the limitations mm-hmm. that we live in. If he doesn't, if he wants to do something, he's going to do it. Yeah. It is what it is. He's bigger than the language barriers right. and any other kind of thing. All right, let's look at our last reading in the John's Gospel. And Olivia, since you've been knocking it out, we're going <laughs> to complete the trifecta here, right. and you're going to go ahead and read. So we're John 14, verses 23 to 31, and this is Jesus talking to his people here. Okay. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, 
But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the word, the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. I love this one. There's so much in this that's encouraging. I, I especially like, and someone with some Greek knowledge or whatever it may be could help me out here, but I especially like the translation of the word helper. Mm-hmm. Putting that to the Holy Spirit to me takes away that false perception that God is somehow this lording tyrant over top of me that just wants to push my buttons. Helper to me speaks, this person is, or this this spirit is with me, walking with me, leading me, guiding me for my benefit. A helper doesn't do anything to your detriment. It does everything to help you, to lead you, to benefit you. And to me, that's a very, very simple and comforting word there. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's funny. I was just looking back at um, the note on verse 16 has also refers to the Holy Spirit as helper. And so it refers to the Greek and it says it's called the comforter Mm -hmm. or someone who appears on another's behalf, like an advocate. Even better, comforter. Counselor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lots of good names for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and where Christ says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So it's, uh, he's leaving us a peace that's different. Like, I don't read Jesus saying there, oh, now everything's going to be smooth. No more wars, no more illness, no more suffering, no more divorce, no more all this mess. I see him saying, I've made peace with you, between you and God. I'm, I am giving you this peace, and it's different than what the world can give you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a permanency to His peace. Mm-hmm. You know that can can handle the assaults of this world and the tribulations and trials of this world, and remain in you in the midst of the tribulation. You know, uh, and and some of that's because the the peace he gives us is the objective salvation that he's given to us. You know, that's a a sure thing, if you will. Uh, so if my if my peace is this happens a lot of times in uh, if, if you work with addicts or, or people who have addicts in their family is if my peace is on a wire to your behavior, well then my peace will be disrupted all the yep. time. You don't do something that I expect or whatever. Yep. You know, but. This piece is, the object of this piece is different. So if you're looking for a kind of piece that's like, well, I, I want peace always in this human relationship. Well, good luck. You know, you're not going to always have that. Right. You know? But if the peace is anchored in Christ, his promises, salvation, that he's, he's sealed with his blood, sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, right, then that peace sustains itself through any conflict and tribulation. Mm-hmm. But so I, I kind of like that. That's why he gives, not as the world gives, because the the world it's, it's like a moving target. If if you're trying to pin peace on various worldly things, it's always moving. Right. Yeah, I think verse twenty seven is kind of like, especially in light of everything that we experience in today's world. You know, it's kind of like Jesus's mic drop moment. <laughs> it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm leaving you my peace, and it's not like this world, and like what else do we need to rest on? Like, it's just such a comforting and solid foundation to just rest in, especially when we consider all of the turmoil that's constantly going on, um, mm-hmm. which seems to be amplified more and more, you know? Um, but so. really rest on it. Yeah. Like, like, I completely agree with you, and I think what we do on a verse like this is we read it, we put it on a, on a dish towel in the kitchen, and we go, oh. <laughs> But then trouble comes, and all of a sudden we freak out and panic. Right, and our peace is and it's like, upended. Yeah, it's like, what do you yeah. mean? Like, like when the next pandemic comes around, monkeypox. Will our hearts not be troubled? Mm-hmm. Neither let them be afraid. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to be some kind of stoic robots. No. But there is something to this. You, you can be walking out of a hospital with a cancer diagnosis and still have this peace. You can be leaving an employer with just gotten fired 
and this piece is still there. I mean, whatever you're going through in life, this piece doesn't fade. God's grace doesn't somehow dissolve because of something that's happened in the world. But obviously there's that tug of war Mm -hmm. because circumstances in this life do make us feel and do feel broken and do hurt us. So it's... Well, that's why it's the fruit of the spirit, right? It's not yeah. something we conjure up mm. on our own. Great it's point. Spirit given, yeah. um, and I, that's what I love about this passage. I mean, it's so hard to break up these sections because you know we almost need the reading from last week to lead into this week because it's where we're reminded by Jesus in the earlier verses that he, it, our, his spirit will dwell in us, mm-hmm. and when we hold that uh, side by side with the words from this week, you know. This power of the Holy Spirit who helped the apostles to speak in tongues, who gives this peace, it's like it's inside of us. And I think we so often don't live like that's true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like we rarely live as if we know this this spirit and this power is living within us so that we have access to it as believers already. Um I mean, and I'm I'm guilty of it too, which is why I think it riles me up. Like I get frustrated with myself. I'm like, dude, <laughs> you don't need to be stressed. You don't need to be worried or overwhelmed mm-hmm. by these things because you've got God's spirit in you who's empowering you to move forward and to walk in his will each and every day. Yeah, and it's hard even when in moments when you do have that peace in the midst of somebody else's anxiety, right? And you're and you're not emoting in the same way that they are, they often think you don't care. Mm. You know, or that you're not compassionate, or you're aloof, which might not be the case. It could be to what Olivia's saying is, no, I'm I'm confident with the peace I have. I'm confident with the Spirit leading the process and the Spirit's outcome. Because I think that's one of the beautiful things that really, not till we talked about it, that this passage really forces you to do, particularly since we're readers living in a world full of tribulations, and we have sin, and we have salvation all at once is you really have to slow down and look at this and, and ask yourself, I think you're being invited to, is what is the peace that he's talking about? I need to figure that out. You know, So if, if I don't have peace, then clearly what I thought was my peace and I'm losing it isn't the peace he's talking about here. So what is he talking about here? You know, So in one way, it forces you to define what is this peace. How do you have peace when you don't know outcomes? But you do know, see, when you asked that, my brain immediately went to, I don't know the outcomes of this cancer diagnosis, mm-hmm. but I do know the outcome when, yeah, the, when, sure. the, when the lights turn off here. You're right. When right. my life comes to an end, I, when I hear that, I think my peace is knowing the end game. Mm-hmm. And so between now and that end game, Holy Spirit, like you said, help me endure all this mess that's going to greet me from today to the finish line. Yeah, no, that's a definitely a, a, a true point is when you think about this piece, you, you know how it all turns out. So in the tribulations leading up to the end, how's the peace? You know, right. because that peace that you have in the end game is the same peace that should be leading you through this thing that you do not know if this is what the outcome of this yeah. thing will be, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, even in this passage alone down at what is that? verse 30 and 31, Jesus is the perfect example of this. Like he, he straight up says, well, the ruler of the world is coming, but he has no claim on me. So he's like already pointing to the fact that he's overcome and he's got the victory over the Satan. devil. And, and I, I found it interesting when I was reading through this earlier, it's like verse 31, but I do as the father has commanded me. Um, and I think, you know, we see kind of this obedience even earlier um, in the earlier verses. Where was that? Yeah, there's, there's, there's 23 a, and 24, yeah. too. So I yeah. think there's this, this underlying piece of obedience as well. Um, you know, Jesus knows what he's going to be obedient to. He's walking towards his death, you know, but I do as the Father has commanded me. And yet he still has this peace. <laughs> he doesn't give his disciples or us today any excuse to go, well, Jesus didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. like Jesus was completely obedient to to God. And so he set the example for us. He set the stage of perfect obedience, and we are to strive for the same. Yeah, and before we close, there's one one huge point I think that we often forget here too is in verse 25, or no, 26, sorry. 
but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So the point I want to make there is uh, Holy Spirit theology can get really wonky and really weird really fast. And so what I like about this is the Holy Spirit is not untethered in his work. And what I mean by that is he will always be pointing to that which Christ has taught. Christ is teaching that which the Father has given him to teach. So there's a perfect kind of communion of the Trinity together, and it's a pointing inward at each other, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit's not this rogue renegade taking you down a road uh, leading you in new things that God has never spoken of before, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. And so, because I think people can get really weird with the Spirit, and, and we forget he, uh, it's kind of hard to talk about on the one hand, right? He, he's not bound in the sense of he's divine and can do anything, but he is bound in his function and role as the third person of the Trinity, Right to do that which the Trinity has agreed upon doing. Like this is why the creed's good. You know, you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the different functions and roles of the persons, uh, working all together in unity for for the good of uh, salvation and humanity. And so, just remembering that the Holy Spirit isn't just this. Uh, you can't pull him away from the Word and then send him on his way to do what he does. Just silly example. If if someone said the Holy Spirit is revealed to me that that guy over there working at Foot Locker is Jesus the Messiah returned. Mm-hmm. No, because that pulls away from Scripture, right? It says when Christ comes back, all every, every knee will bow. Every, it, it, won't, it won't be something that's, oh, he just snuck in. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and, the phrase I've always heard is, uh, a wordless spirit is a spiritless word. So in other yeah. words, you, you can't separate the Spirit from the Word. Right. So if, if so to no, test it, if someone's saying the Holy Spirit is doing something here, then for us, we're like, nah, what? Go back to God's Word, and if it doesn't align with God's Word, if that's what right. you're saying, then it's not the Holy Spirit telling you to do that. It's not the Holy Spirit working. That's your wonkiness working. Yeah. And you'll hear people try to sanctify their own emotions by saying it's spirit-led when it's really right. that's your personal desire that's not the spirit but it does sound much more better and easier buy-in if i say it's the spirit that led me sure but i've also heard that like the wonky side of things too where it's like you know the spirits led me to marry this person leave my wife here you know and it's like huh like that's not something the spirit the spirit doesn't lead you into something wrong. You right, know? right. But, but that would be a, a wordless spirit. Right. You know? And I would say when people tell me that, which I've heard it more than you would probably hope that I'd ever heard it, uh, is, oh, it's a spirit, no doubt. It's just not the Holy Spirit you're hearing from. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's a spirit, so no it's doubt. It's a spirit, <laughs> you know. And like if, the Holy, if I said the Holy Spirit was going to lead me to put streamers on your motorcycle, that would not be the Holy Spirit <laughs> leading me, right? Cans, we're just It would married. not be the Holy Spirit leading me. That'd be Mark leading me. It'd probably end in a beatdown. Can get a Jocko dummy? He can ride behind me. Oh, like a carpool lane? Does that give you carpool <laughs> privileges? All right. All right. This has been a good conversation. Thrilled to have Olivia with us. Brought a lot of good stuff yes. today. Um, as we go through these, as I always say in ending these, if you heard something this morning or that whenever you're listening to this that didn't make sense or you just have questions about it or just tickled your ear and you thought, man, what about this that we didn't cover? Email it in to us, mark.bray at osomckinney.org. And we'll add, we'll add, uh, mm-hmm. we will add it. I was speaking in tongues right there. Did you see that? <laughs> but, but, but we will add it to our You Ask, We Answer podcast and we'll talk about it. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to us babble here Um, and we'll catch you next time y'all have a good week see what you did there peter you see that